Lovely introduction. So I'll get started right away into my top 10 tips for you on how to ally for women in technology. And first of all, I want to say that I believe that technology reflects the people who make it. And I think at this point in technology with the discussion that we've been having over the last at least 18 months as I've been observing uh, technology, we talk about the fact that the world is made up of 52% women, um, but only 17% of the technical jobs in the worldwide uh, tech workforce are made up of women. So clearly, if we're trying to create solutions to solve the world's problems, as now these days technology actually touches everything that we do, it becomes more and more pervasive, it's really important that we find a way to take some actions to actually start incorporating more diversity and including more women in technology. I think it's wonderful that we've been having this conversation over the last uh, several years, but I feel that it's important that we actually take a few actions. And so based on some of the feedback that I've gotten from the Java developer community who I work with, I put this talk together to really take a look at, well, what's happening here and what are, what are some things we can do to actually take some action? Because if you look at the research, it's true that if you have teams with not just men and not just women, but teams with men and women, the collective intelligence of the group actually rises regardless of individual IQ. So in that way, you're going to have solutions and products that are more creative, more innovative, and not only that, but also more profitable. So diversity and including more people of all different types is not just the right thing to do from a humanity perspective, but it's also going to create better technology and is going to have an impact on the ROI of companies as well as the gross domestic product of countries. So I'll share with you that this is actually not a topic I ever thought I would talk about. And there is actually research uh, saying that women who talk about these kinds of topics around diversity actually are viewed negatively in terms of their job performance, a little bit more negatively, by both men and women. So I, I take this brave step and go ahead and talk about it anyway. Um, I've been working in the Silicon Valley for over 15 years now, so I've had an opportunity to observe lots of different uh, human behavior that's part of my job and that I'm a community manager, community connector, working with Java developers all over the world. So I have had an opportunity to really collect some interesting insights. And one of those that I've come across that is very pervasive even today and that I myself came into tech thinking was that tech was a meritocracy. And Working hard was all it was going to take for me to be successful. And in that respect, when I first came into tech, I put my head down and did my job really well and paid very little attention to what was happening around me. I actually hardly noticed that I was one of the only women working in the Java developer team. So uh, really what it came down to was I realized for men or for women, and especially today as the software development model becomes more and more open, that working hard and doing your job is going to get you absolutely nowhere. You need to be, of course, exceptional at your technical skills and the job that you're doing. But if you want to really thrive and succeed, you need to be expanding your influence, increasing your visibility, and broadening your network. And in order to do that, you need to have sponsors, mentors, and allies. And being that the tech workforce is made up of about 80% men. Of course, it takes men to really affect any of this, to have sponsors, mentors, and allies. Women need men. We need the men to take part in this to make a change. And of course, sometimes when I start th talking about this topic, people say, well, let's focus on the pipeline. It's all about the girls and getting girls interested in technology. And I believe that's true. And I do think there are lots of new efforts going on over the last few years to get children, both boys and girls, involved in technology early and keep them involved in terms of STEM curriculum and education. And that's all around the world. And that's wonderful, but this talk for the next 15 minutes, what I'm going to share with you are really the top 10 tips of what we can do as people working in technology, both men and women, to impact the, the diversity and um, increase the different types of people all throughout our ecosystem. So starting with one, and I think this is the most important one and why I put it first, is first of all, ally is a unique word in that it's, it's talked about frequently, but oftentimes when people talk about it, they think of it as a noun, I am an ally. 
But I think it's important that we start to take some actions, and therefore I encourage you to think of it as a verb, something that you do sometimes. So you're not going to do it all the time, but you're going to do things. You're going to recommend women, sponsor women, mentor women, follow women, invite women to speak. So think of all those actions that you can do that will actually affect the change. And number two, uh, be open and listen. So I think it's important to, to kind of set the context of this conversation. It's uncomfortable, right? I mean, that's why I told you, first of all, it's not something that naturally comes to me and I want to talk about all the time. It's uncomfortable for everyone, men and women, and it's also intersectional. So there are lots of different factors that are going to affect your, a person's unique experience of this, whether it's race, age, uh, sexual orientation, um, ability, so oftentimes that comes into play. So it all intersects with gender. Um, and so I think in that respect, oftentimes when people come to this topic, they'll try to maybe approach it with humor. And I think we all like humor, but oftentimes I see that backfire. So what I like to encourage people to do when you're you know, stepping up and trying to take some actions to be supportive of women is to just be straightforward. Um, Recognize that you're not necessarily always going to get it right. We're all going to make mistakes. Um, but try to be more straightforward and simple and direct in the words that you take when you approach these different situations that you may run into. Okay, so it's just setting the context. Those are first two things you can do in your head in terms of developing an action mindset and being sensitive to the fact that everyone's experience is going to be completely different. Third is assignment distribution. So I think assignment distribution can work in any field, but particularly in technology. Um, there's housework and there's real work. And so oftentimes housework can be managing projects, doing things like pulling the team together, where owning and writing the code or the data in any case is the real work. So the work where you're seeing people who want to get assigned to these high value projects. So be aware when you're seeing the distribution in your team, who's being assigned to these projects? Is there a certain type of person that's always assigned to do more of a housework type of job and another person that's getting the more um, high profile opportunities who really is owning the, the big um, projects that are driving your company or your open source project forward? It's important to recognize that you should have some balance there and be conscious of that fact because I believe what I've seen in my last 15 years working in tech is oftentimes women will just want to go in and do the housework because, I just say housework, because it's natural inclination. I just want to get it done. If something needs to get done, step in and get it done. So I think men being conscious of that fact that it's important to have both men and women doing these types of activities really helps to balance the environment. Number four, create a friendly environment. So I'm not sure if you're aware of the fact that over 40% of women who do get involved in working in a job in technology actually leave the field within 10 years where only about 15% of men do. So as I mentioned early, I do, earlier, I do believe there is a pipeline problem and there are things that we can do, but clearly there still are things that we can do as people working in the field to affect that number and bring that down in terms of the number of women who are leaving. And when you look at you know, the reasons why they're leaving, often it is from that example I just gave before. So they feel they're not getting the prime ex um, assignments or sexist behavior, or just feeling that they don't belong. So that's why I believe creating a friendly environment is very important. So it may be that maybe there's only one or two women on the team, but if you can go ahead and talk to them about their work, ask them questions about their work, look for a way that, they, that you can connect with them without trying to compare them to another woman in your life, which is, I think, a natural tendency to do. So keeping in mind you know, that uniqueness about each person, right, without making those comparisons, um, I think that goes a long way. So look for, that, look for that commonality, but try to keep it tied to, to work, at least to start. Um, and again, people make mistakes, no big deal, but just the fact that you actually make an effort to connect, I think is key. So number four, okay, number five, speak up. So speaking up in meetings and forums and conferences, I think is one of the most important tips that you can do because what you often see is people just standing by and letting things slide, right? So they're not participating in themselves, but they're silently allowing it to happen. So that's where sexist behavior really thrives, is just 
good people letting things go without saying anything. So I have a couple of examples um, that I like to talk about. One of them is interrupting. So it's proven that women are interrupted almost three times more than men are. So it's just a fact of human behavior. It's been scientifically, scientifically proven. So certain things that can happen there when you're in a meeting, right? So if you see someone being interrupted, step in and politely ask if that person can finish speaking, right? That's one of the things you can do. Another thing that you can do is if you see people who are, who are reluctant to speak because they continue to be interrupted, try to pull the people who are not participating into this discussion and ask for their feedback, right? Because that's one of the things that I talked about, why teams with both men and women are so successful is because it brings in different viewpoints. So if you have an environment in your team meetings where you're not hearing from every team member, you're not really getting that benefit of having a diverse team. So not only looking at um, minimizing the interruptions on your, in your team meetings and at conferences, but also looking at how you can pull in participation from everyone. And the other really common things that, that happens is that a woman will make a suggestion and for whatever reason it's not heard or someone else will come up and say a really similar thing and take credit for that idea. And that also has some scientific backing to it in terms of women's voices and the pitch. Actually, some men don't hear the suggestion. They really do think it's their suggestion. So one thing that you can do in there, I call it amplify. So if you do hear a woman that decides to speak up and give an idea in a meeting, amplify that idea. So build on top of it. Say, yes, as she just said, you know, I agree and add a little bit more, but really just giving credit to that idea and making sure that it sticks in the meeting. So those are two really good, good tips for speaking up. Um, and you can do that in meetings at work, whether in person, video, or on the phone, in online forums, as well as at conferences such as this one. And of course, especially at conferences um, or in after hours events, sometimes there are more difficult or inappropriate situations, as I like to say. And again, I think men, you know, just being on the um, aware, having that in their awareness that if you see something that you find maybe the woman looks a little bit uncomfortable or doesn't really want to be talking about this topic. Maybe it's not really an appropriate talk topic to be discussing in a work context. Intervene. So I always like to say you can redirect the conversation. If you want to address it full on, you know, straight out, feel free. But oftentimes what I found is just to kind of minimize the conflict, it's helpful to just redirect the conversation in a different area or pull the person who's uncomfortable aside and say you want to introduce them to someone else. So kind of redirecting something when it happens. It, it it's been known to happen in, in lots of different situations. And personally, I've been uh, appreciative to have this happen in, for, with me in a couple of conference situations. Just someone kind of steering me away when I look a, a little bit uncomfortable. That helps. Number seven, character traits. So you may or may not be aware that there's a thing called uh, character criticism. And oftentimes, um, women are on this little bit of a tightrope is how I like to describe it. So you're kind of walking a fine line between being too feminine to be effective and too masculine to be likable. So oftentimes you'll hear about these character traits like, oh, she's cursing too much or she's too bossy or she's... Uh, too um, abrasive is a really popular one. I actually have that on my, my next slide. I found a little bit of research talking about abrasive, particularly in um, the context of performance reviews, right? That's just a word that really isn't used to describe a man's behavior. And oftentimes what I've found in my personal experience is that when I'm really on, only the only woman working in a situation, I'll often mimic the behavior of the people around me, which being that they're men, um, I'm mirroring their behavior. Rather than being more authentically who I am, I start to mirror their behavior, and that can become perceived as bossy or aggressive or, um, yeah, abrasive. <laughs> that word again. I have to admit, I have been called abrasive, and, and granted, I don't know most of you, but really, I view myself more as a warm community connector. I really don't view myself as cold and abrasive. 
but oftentimes, you know, that's how my behavior is perceived. And the fact that sometimes I have allies who step in and tell me that I'm being perceived that way is really helpful. So you can try to do that. And again, one of the key points that I'd like to make is this isn't about changing women, but it is being aware that perception is reality. So if you're being perceived a certain way in terms of how you're behaving, whether you're being influenced by mirroring other people around you, which is human biology, human behavior, um, just be aware of that, right? It's not about changing who you are because women really, the reason that we're seeing teams be more effective and productive with women is because of the behaviors that many women intri intrinsically exhibit, right? They're connectors, they're collaborators, they're looking at lim limiting risks. So these are all things that help to make teams more effective. So we don't want to look at how to change women, but just be aware of the fact when you're perceiving behavior that you might be doing a little bit of this uh, character criticism. Number eight, encourage norms. So this I think is really helpful, especially in job descriptions. So there are certain um, norms that are um, kind of unwritten in the technology space, and the two that I've identified are self-promotion and negotiation. So if you want to be effective in technology, you need to self-promote. If you read engineer developer descriptions, it says, are you, are you a world-class developer? Well, if you look at men and women, oftentimes you'll see women saying, well, that's not me. Uh, and men saying, yeah, absolutely, I'm world class. I'm, that's, the, that's the perfect job for me. Um, or you, you have the description written with the ideal candidate has these 10 different skills, right? And a man will look at that and say, oh, I have two or three of these, and so I'll, I'll apply, I'll learn on the job. And it's more common for a woman to say, well, I don't quite meet all of these descriptions, and therefore I won't apply for the job. So I think normalizing these types of things in your job descriptions can help quite a bit because you're encouraging more women to apply. Because often when um, I do these types of talks, one of the most common questions is we want to hire more women. We put it in our culture that this is important to us, diversity is important, and we just don't get any women applicants. So I, I don't know what we can do. Well, one of the things you can do is look at your job descriptions and normalize it in there that some of these skills will be needed. Um, not all of them, and take out things like, you know, I'm the best engineer, world-class engineer, all those kind of things that are maybe will, you know, be overlooked by a man, but not necessarily by the women. And again, what you can do is in, look to actively encourage women to apply for those jobs. And negotiation is the same thing. So with salary as well as tasks at work, again, you know, I think men and women come into technology thinking that you're going to be judged based solely on your work, but you just is a fact that you have to negotiate and you learn over time that that is something that you're going to need to do in terms of negotiating the tasks that you receive as well as negotiating your salary. So that's something that you need to do. And if you don't go into it negotiating salary and knowing that that's part of how you're going to get ahead is having to ask for things and not thinking that it's going to be given to you. If you can display these things and encourage them and put it out in the open that these are the norms that you need to work within, it will help to level the playing field between men and women. Number nine, educate yourself. Uh, unconscious bias is something, again, that I feel everyone talks about, but we don't necessarily do anything about it. Um, so I think it's one of those words that we just throw around. And I think it's one of those things that people say, I don't have unconscious bias. It's just automatic. It's a negative thing, so I don't have it. I want everyone to be viewed equally. I'm, I don't have unconscious bias, and it's immediately written off. Well. I believe we all have bias, and that's part of being human. We just receive too much information, so as humans, we pattern match and we put things in categories. So you need to just be aware of that fact. So mentoring someone different from you is a great way to learn and to also kind of catch some of these intrinsic things that you start to believe about people. Uh, mentoring someone different from you, oftentimes, I've, I see this both ways, men think that they can't mentor a woman because they don't necessarily want to think it's inappropriate or anyone would view it as inappropriate. And women often feel they need a woman to mentor them because they want to see a role model, someone who is similar to them, which 
I can understand as well. I, I have had several mentors. I've never had a woman mentor, so clearly it can be done. You can succeed in tech without having a mentor who's someone exactly like you. And I think it's actually a really, you can learn a tremendous amount by mentoring or being a mentee of someone who's different from you. You can really look at things from a different perspective. So I think that's one really important way to recognize your unconscious bias. Another thing you can do when you run into situations that um, you might recognize as having a little bit of bias loaded in there is actually share with someone else who's not related to the situation. And when you share a situation of what's happened, share not how you feel about it or what you think about it, but share what actually happened. So what the person did, what the person said, not what you think or why you think they did it, but what they said and what they did. And you can often uncover lots of different things in there that maybe you, you unconsciously thought about the situation, but you'll discover are not necessarily true. So there's lots of unconscious bias training out there that you can take. Those are just a couple of my top tips in terms of taking into account unconscious bias, mentoring, and then doing that exercise of sharing with someone else not related to the situation. Now, as I said earlier, I am often one of the only women. This is my most common meeting here. This is my almost male panel, being that I'm usually the only woman meeting with 30 or so different men um, in the Java community process. It's, it's very male-centric community. And I've had great experience with this. I've had many mentors, allies, even sponsors, people who have pushed me forward. But Many of them also say they want to see more women without actually doing anything about it. A lot of these same things that I've shared, and so they've asked me what you can do. Well, don't just say the call for papers is open. Actually go out to some of those women in your community and tell them you want them to have a session at your conference. Tell them you want to have them come speak. Um, follow them on social media recommend them for job promotions. So coming back to those verb actions that I told you about, actually, rather than say you want something, actually go do something. And in kind of keeping in, in mind all of those tips I had before in terms of, well, maybe I'm not good enough to submit this session. That extra little bit of encouragement that you can give to a woman in your community or at your workplace may be the thing that gets them to submit a session. And they don't have to be the best. They don't have to be the highest um, developer. They don't have to be the only person who has knowledge in this subject. Oftentimes, they can just learn something and give a talk about that experience. And another way, if they're not ready necessarily to be a solo speaker, if there's some resistance to that fact, offer to be a co-speaker with them. That's Some of the best sessions that I see at conferences are actually with two speakers. So having two people play off of each other can be a lot more interesting for an audience. And it also takes a little bit of the pressure off for a first time presenter, especially when you see some of that perfectionist tendency coming into play. So I encourage you to consider some of those ways in terms of building in more speakers. And then you can do the same thing in your work environments and online conferences as well, actually soliciting women to participate, asking for them directly if they can share something rather than just say anyone can participate. That's great. And I think we've done that for a while now. But I, I haven't seen too much change in the numbers, which is why I put these top 10 tips together. And obviously, you're here and you care about this topic. I think that we can do this, and wanting to do this is awesome. It's a first step. Like I said earlier, don't be discouraged. If you get negative feedback because your suggestions were taken the wrong way, that's going to happen. Um, but you're trying to make a difference, and that's the important part. So we're all going to make mistakes. And we can be the change that we wish to see and create a better world with more diverse opinions and solutions that are going to be a benefit to the entire population, not just a fraction of it. So I have lots more I could share, but this was my short uh, talk for you here today. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter if you want to hear any more about these tips. I believe I left a few minutes for questions because I, no, no more questions. OK, all right. I thought I had five minutes for questions. No, I'm over. Oh, so we're finished. Chat with me on Twitter after the talk. Thanks for your patience. <laughs>